I don't know how I'm going to follow on from Kalinde. Every time I hear the brother speak, he's just a dynamic speaker and goes in deep and takes you all over the place, other dimensions and so forth. So I think today I'm here to actually just bring you back to Earth <laughs> and um, cover some of the basic research that I've been dealing with over the last year or so as far as trying to find out more about Africa and its role with the entheogenic legacy. Um, my background, as Anna said, I was at the Breaking Convention two years ago. I've also um, been organising events and workshops in the African Caribbean community in London or throughout the country, London primarily, dealing with spirituality, history, culture and so forth. And um, basically I became aware of this whole realm through my research and study and it was basically an area that I kept on coming face to face with and avoiding basically because it was such a taboo subject for myself within our community and basically yeah Kalinde on one of his lectures was giving uh, information in regards to martial arts and mushrooms and how you know it connected with African culture and so forth and I thought well you know outside of having an experience itself which I think is the real research I also just delved into a few you know bits and pieces a few books and I'm just going to share some of my findings with you today so if I don't get right through today, and it's the first time I'm doing this, today also um, I had some issues with the PowerPoint and stuff, so I had to try and make them into JPEG files, so bear with me. But if we don't get through to the end, I'll just put up some of the references. Basically, I've just lifted all of this out of these books here <laughs> and um, a few websites and, you know, just kind of put, put a few of the pieces together myself. But the main um, book which I found pretty interesting was this one here, African Psy Psychoactive Plants by a collective of researchers coming out of South Africa. You've also got the mushrooms and the Yoruba people of Nigeria and the Yoruba mythology and medicinal medicine by B.A. Asso. Both of these books are pretty useful. We're all familiar with Terence McKenna. There was a paper out of the um, Revision magazine, which I used as a reference, as well as um, a few internet-inspired um, articles. So where do we start? Um, I'm, ju I'm just exactly the opposite of what Kalinde said. I'm relying on this PowerPoint presentation to actually, <laughs> to actually deliver it to you. And this is my foundations. And it basically is, um, well, I'll just read it. Psychoactive plants have been used by humans for recreational, spiritual and therapeutic purposes for millennia. Africa, Africa possesses an ancient tradition of medicinal plant use and has a rich tradition using its indigenous plants for these purposes. Given Africa's high floristic diversity and strong connection between plants and many African cultures and societies, relatively few African psychoactive plants have been investigated in detail when compared to the Americas. And that was basically how I got into this as far as research. I was coming to the conference in Canterbury, a few other workshops and seminars, and predominantly I was hearing a lot geared around you know, various cultures, and I couldn't see myself in that basically, and where, I, where my culture fitted into all of this. And to finally de delve deep, I was aware of history, for example's sake, that when you're dealing with history, when you go to the source, a lot of it, is not, a lot of it primarily starting within, within Africa, the continent of Africa, and as we know, it, it, it furthered out from there. So my, basically I was just thinking, well, there must be a connection with the psychedelics and there must be a relationship there somewhere or another. So I stepped out and there is. So here we go. Um, I won't read all of this, but here it's basically dealing with um, the same paradigm that America, the Americas has got a lot of information out there in regards to psychedelics. They had studied over 97, I believe, reviewed plants, but only eight of those were coming out of Africa. Um, and basically it was, they were saying it's contrary to the fact that there's hundreds, thousands of plants in Africa being used by indigenous people all over the continent. Like the brother was saying, it's a vast space. So um, my, my journey today is basically going to be looking at Central Africa, we're going to hit a north, south, east, west and find a few groups that are, found that are dealing with psychoactive plants. Um, I've had a conversation with Clindy a few times and there's a few key words that I'm going to be using today which I'm going to use but it's not really the terms that I would personally use. So one is um, shaman. Um, as we know, shaman comes, up, comes out of Siberia specifically and deals with the Siberian system and when dealing with Africa we don't use the term shaman. So depending on where you are in the part of the land will determine what the title is for the priest or the witch doctor for example and we use terms like Sangoma, Babalawal and Nganga. These are coming out of um, South Africa, Nigeria and the Congo. Um, and another term, I'll get there, 
um, is um, where I'll get there. But basically pygmy, because we're going to go deal with the Congo and you've got a group primarily called the pygmy and that's not the term that they're referred to by themselves. They're known as, they come under various names like the Twa, the Aka tribe, the Baka tribe and so forth. But we're going to be using that interchangeably. So on my journey, where did I start? I started with these so-called pygmies who live in several ethnic um, groups in Rwanda, Burundi, Uganda, the Democratic Republic of Congo and so forth as you can see. Uh, most, mostly they're partially hunt, hunter-gatherers living off wild products and the land basically. Key thing about this group that I've always been aware of once I found out is just basically their legacy, how far they actually go back. So for me it was about going to the source, trying to find out well where did this start and who were the groups that initiated this and I found out that it's these groups here. Um, they have far, you know, great knowledge dealing with astronomy, you know, the forests, uh, as above, so below. I know these are some of the principles that these people brought to the table. So it's genetically, these so-called pygmies are extremely divergent um, about, um, from all other human populations, suggesting they have this Asian indigenous lineage. Their uniparental markers represent the most ancient, divergent ones right after those typically found in the Khoisan peoples out of South Africa. Um, yeah, more information just dealing with the various tribes. As I said, they're known as the Aka, Mbenga, the Baka, Mbuti, and the Twa tribes. You can primarily find 250 to 600,000 of them living in the Congo. Um, key things, yeah, they live in a forest, swamp, desert. At the very bottom, hunter gatherers, I saw that these people gather wild fruit, mushrooms, and honey. Just like the brother was saying, I can't believe that there'll be a group of people that eat mushrooms and whether they were edible, poisonous, eventually you're going to get around to sampling these mushrooms. And for me, that was a, you know, a catalyst for looking into some more of their background. And before we get there, um, there was this um, piece of mythology that was coming out of Gabon and the Congo dealing with the Briti culture. Um, it's quoting from Schultz and Hoffman's popular book um, dealing with um, the god Zami. And where is it? It's basically dealing with Ebola. So this is my intro, going back to it, basically when I first found out about Africa and psychedelics, the main one that was being thrown out there was Ebola. And I was thinking, well, is that the only plant that's being used? And obviously it's not, but there's a lot of information geared around that. And as they're saying here, it's, you know, shrouded in superstition and, you know, a lot of hocus pocus mumbo jumbo. And that's, I think, how people viewed it. And one reason why most people, researchers and whoever it is, stayed out of Africa. Um, in doing the research. I'm also aware that a lot of the information is part of the mystery system and for whatever reason it stayed as part of the mystery system and it's not been as accessible as some other places that you might travel to and get that type of information regarding psychedelics and the role that they play. But here it says um, Zami, the, one of the last created gods in the Briti culture, gave Iboka one day he saw a pygmy, Bitamu, high in the Atanga tree, gathering fruit. He made him fall. He died and Zami brought his, brought his spirit to him. Zami cut off his little fingers and his little toes of the dead body of the pygmy and planted them in various parts of the forest. They then grew into the Aboka bush. And there's several mythologies, especially out of Nigeria, another area where I found there's loads of mythologies and they're tying back into the psychedelics, whether it was the Aboka, the Aboga or mushrooms, for example. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Babongo tribe, or the Bongo tribe coming out of Gabon as well. Uh, what's his name? Bruce Parry, done the tribe series, was spent some time there with these people. Um, here it says, they are an agricultural people of Gabon in the equator Africa, who are known as forest people due to their recent foraging economy. Though considered Mbenga pygmies, they are not particularly short. They are the originators of the Briti religion, based on consumption of the intoxicating hallucinogenic Iboga plant. Briti practitioners use the psychedelic disassociative root bark of the Tabernathi boga plant, specially cultivated for the religion, to promote radical spiritual growth, to stabilize community and family structure, to meet religious requirements, and to resolve pathological problems. And I think that's something that we all could deal with and <laughs> apply wherever you are in the world. Um, the root bark has been consumed for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. Um, in a Briti Whites of Passage ceremony. And as we know, quite a few people are familiar with um, Iboga, and I'm sure there's more people speaking of it, about it over the weekend. 
coming out of Africa for a hot minute into the Americas is just another piece of information I thought was interesting that in the 1950s the CIA conducted experiments to what the effects of Ebogaine were on the, were on the user in relationship to addictions, methadone, opiates, cocaine and alcohol. These experiments were done at Lexington Federal Penitentiary on African-American inmates and were held in secret and hidden from the public until a document request regarding Ebogaine through the Freedom of Information Act years later in the 1980s was obtained by Howard Lotsoff. The document was a letter by a CIA doctor requesting more supplies of Ebogaine because he was having success with his patients. LSD and like the other psychoactives were also administered to inmates at Lexington during this period. Um, so here we go. So we started in the central regions in Congo, Gabon and so forth. And we're going to move up to the north and into Algeria. I'm sure all of you are f or many of you are familiar with some of these cave paintings. It's in a lot of the books that I was looking into dealing with psilocybin and the origins of psilocybin. I know today a lot of people when they see or think of North Africa, it's kind of like they've separated it from the continent and it's not considered part of Africa. So I've, I've always found that a bit strange. So I'm looking at the landmass, I look at the artwork and I see a lot of the synchronicities and I see that again, it's one people. So here they make reference to, um, where is it? It's Terence McKenna in his book, um, Food of the Gods. He hypothesized that the Neolithic culture that inhabited this site in Algeria used psilocybin mushrooms as part of its religious ritual life, citing rock paintings showing persons holding mushroom-like objects in their hands as well as mushrooms growing from their bodies. We know that at least one psilocybin mushroom, psilocybin cubensis or Strophea cubensis, is a circumtropical in its distribution, occur occurring throughout the warm, wet tropics whenever the cattle of the Bos Indicus type are present. And as it was mentioned earlier on in the previous presentation, a lot of the tribes, cattle herders, work closely with these, um, with the cattle, and no doubt that they was coming across the mushrooms and using them. And again, for whatever reason, the legacy hasn't been continued and being shared amongst the people today. I personally think it goes back down to the mystery systems. Um, I won't read all of this, but it's basically just saying that these groups, um, 30 to 5,000 years ago, moved out to various parts of the world and obviously took with them their practices and uses of these plants and shared it with other groups and so forth. Um, we can go to the Ivory Coast. On the west coast of Africa, it talks about a group, um, it doesn't give the name, but by the French researcher Yves Sol Solbrillard and his book called Solomon the Healer of Power Plants the healer or the power of plants, should I say, sorry. And he's got two whole chapters dedicated to the use of hallucinogenic mushrooms. One of them is known as the mushroom of knowledge. I can't remember the original name. And there's also the second one, which is the mushroom of... The mushroom of action, my bad, here it is, yeah, the mushroom of action. And basically, obviously, just like the brother was saying, in various groups, the mushrooms are being used for specific, specific use, usages. So whether it was for warfare, for healing, for um, communicating with ancestors, they had various usages for these, for these mushrooms. So I found it on the West Coast. Um, I also went into Nigeria and saw that the use of the Yoruba, the Yoruba priesthood used the mushrooms. Um, I'll read this. It says, mushrooms have been used from ancient times and is connected with mysticism. Ironically, the first record of mushrooms used as hallucinogenic agent was credited to the Yoruba tribe of Nigeria in Africa. The records date back to the Paleolithic period, 7,000 to 9,000 years ago. In eastern countries like China and Japan, the knowledge of the use of edible and medicinal mushrooms have been passed on from one generation to another. Um, and that's basically not the case in Nigeria because it's an old tradition and it wasn't recorded or written down. So they've got various quotes here and I've got the references of Akpaja in nine, 2003 and Ayola Delhi. And these are coming out of Niger the Nigerian University. Loads of studies have been done and are readily available up until as recent as in 2009. 
Um, also in Nigeria there's a, something called the mushroom churches. Obviously even if you look at the huts in Africa, the, the template or the design is based upon a mushroom design and there's a whole lot of information geared around that and how in the Yoruba the, one of the names for mushroom, Olokun, I believe it is, is um, synchronizes with the great goddess heaven and is the same name for mushroom so there's a synchronicity i did work with synchronicity so there's a connection between heaven or the other side the, the great goddess and the mushroom and whether the mushroom gives you access to the great goddess on the other side for me that's the maths that i was doing and i see that it all connects but the mythology here in the congo makes reference to mushrooms again and olongkok it says plays a crucial role in the genesis of the universe the earth originated from a mushroom as a as from an egg. More precisely, the mushroom considered as having the shape of an egg split in the middle. The upper half rose and became the sky, the lower part became the earth. From the two halves of Alonkot, this is the name of the mushroom. All visible things came out, the stars, the sun, mountains, rivers, plants, animals and the great mother was also called Alonkot. Lightning was a separate egg and so the great mother got the fire. Um, the Zulus, as the brother was saying again, many, many uses with the Zulus, they use a cannabis snuff pack for, for their warfare as well as um, the psilocybin mushroom. Um, here, the Maasai, as the brothers talk about that, the Maasai warriors of Tanzania, they use it for their warfare too. Um, where I'll go from here. You've also got the Torah that's being used by the Zulus. They call it Loya, which means bewitched or cast. And basically, um, I've heard on, on many occasions, they go into like a trance-like state and basically don't give a damn when they're going out and have a fear for, you know, if someone's got, if you, you've got a bow and arrow and someone's got a bullet, I know t t nowadays it'd be something that you wouldn't go ahead on with and you'll think about it. So obviously there's this um, pushing you beyond, you know, as we said, whether it's into other dimensions, other worlds, but pushing you beyond, you know, dealing with your fear, that journey, that journey that we're all on. And obviously it's being used for the young boys who go through their, um, through their warriorship, basically. Um, there's a lot I wanted to speak about, and me and my nerves are going at the moment, I'm sweating and all the rest of it. But in conclusion, the point was really just to share the fact that there's psychoactive plants throughout Africa, from the north, south, east, west. Um, it's not being spoken about in depth uh, when, you know, when you come to the conferences and so forth. So I thought I put myself on the line, throw my two pence in today, and hopefully some of you real researchers, studiers, those who invested in future studies can look into potentially you know, harnessing some of that, bringing it back, making it relevant for some of the people in this part of the world, like myself, who have been disconnected from my people, my community, my heritage, for several reasons and would like to reconnect and are not able to based upon the circumstances and dynamics we've now been put in. And I would just like to take this opportunity rather than ask me any questions, because I said I'm not really you know, um, too familiar with some of the, you know, the, the, root, the roots of where this is coming from outside of what resonates with me, what you know, the, the research that I was looking into personally. So if there's any feedback from you guys as far as areas of knowledge you're aware in Africa, the usage of plants, some of that will be very useful to me to continue my studies and whether it's a year or two years time I like to be back here and deliver you a real type presentation. So on that note I'll leave it there and thank you all.
No, I'm not familiar with that, Ollie. Um, you're bringing that to me now. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe we just need to, yeah, you can, you can actually feel me. And I'm just aware that there's, you know, as I said, hundreds to thousands of plants that are being used directly in an alchemical form. And as I said, I'm just entering that area of study and research myself. So, no, nah, but thank you for that. <laughs> thank you for that. Yeah. Um, well, I can only speak for myself and my own experience. I'm born and bred in London, East London specifically, and I was raised where I went to school in Camden. And on a Monday morning, one of the funniest things was always hearing the white guys come in on a Monday saying, yeah, we've done this, MDMA, ecstasy. And to me, it was just always a thing like you guys are just a bunch of druggies and hippies, basically, like coming from that background. And from my peers and the people that I was around, it's basically a taboo. It's just nothing, you know, you can smoke a bit of weed, have a bit of drink. And that's basically what the deal was. As far as, you know, serious study, even experience, it was just something that I was never aware of until I was personally delving into more areas of my own research, like I said, and finding out about the Brie tea and it's like, well, they're using these plants. So, you know, what's cool? why wasn't I made aware of that? How comes the research I was doing up until that point hadn't made it clear to me? Which it was always there. I was just in denial. I just thought it was, you know, something that was a taboo. So I can only speak for myself. But I say that's the case in many cases. I've been putting on these workshops and lectures now for, uh, for many years, but specifically with regards to psychedelics for the last two years. And it's hard to get some of our people out to represent and find out and learn more. And that's basically what I'm trying to do, because as I've found out, my research shows me that we're the source of, of, of the whole, you know, of this movement. So it'd be, yeah, it'd be cool to get more people involved and more aware. And it's in our DNA and that's how we're trying to access it. So that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm not a presenter, you know what I'm saying? That, oh, I've just come off now. We put, we've got a few workshops lined up. We've got Brother Kalinde speaking next week as well at the gallery. We've also got Rack Rasman and his friend Nen speaking on Wednesday as well, dealing with Aboriginal culture and psychedelics and so forth. So that's what I think I'm not even think that's what I am doing to bring to the table to basically open up some doorways and make it, you know, make it more well known basically. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Please, hold up.